urban life. In the 1950s, when the auto was made king, they built the Garden State East Orange Parkway. has long had the reputation of being a good town, clean, quiet, uncorrupted, lovely. But beneath the graceful suburban shade trees, there's a growing stridency of urban life. In the 1950s, when the auto was made king, they built the Garden State Parkway, slashing the city in two, north to south. In the 1960s, they laid in Interstate 280 east to west. It's still unfinished, cutting the city into four. To connect the two highways, they built a winding interchange and created a drab island of bricks and mortar, encircled by whining asphalt. East Orange has been dubbed Crossroads City. These highways are, or will be, life-giving arteries for the economy of megalopolis. But progress keeps whizzing by Crossroads City. East Orange has changed. Most of the wealthy and middle-class whites have moved out. New the city has less available housing space. The schools are overcrowded. Municipal services are strained. Taxes are sky high. The highways are only part of the change, but they are symbolic. For it's clear that East Orange is a city at the crossroads in more than a geographical sense. East Orange was once a suburban city. Now it's a city in the suburb, struggling desperately to maintain its high standards. It has undergone the classic transition has long been a commuter town. And although the highways have become the chief means of commuter transportation, the Erie Lackawanna still offers reliable service for those who work in Manhattan or Newark. It did not create much of a stir when Duke's department store closed out at the end of 1970 because most of the fine, well-appointed stores along Central Avenue already had gone to the suburbs. Now, Central Avenue, the first of the suburban shopping centers in this region of New Jersey, is a ghost of the city's elegant past. It may have been the economy's way of trading off, but as the elite stores were moving out, East Orange was being turned into a sub-regional office center, especially for insurance and manufacturing sales companies. At first, business was satisfied with the suburban style. More recently, modern office buildings have been going up like miniature Manhattan 6th Avenues. Off-street parking is an indispensable component because most of those who work here live It's elsewhere. a great city. There's no question in my mind about that. William Hart has been mayor of East Orange since January 1970. He was running the city without fanfare later that year when national attention was focused on the election of another black mayor Kenneth Gibson in Newark. Mayor Hart is his city's number one booster. A great many of our citizenry are homeowners. It uh, has a long, outstanding record of good education, one of the best police departments in the state, probably the best fire department in the state. And uh, we have um, very strong leadership on our city council over the years. We've never had any scandal whatsoever for many of our city officials, and that's pretty great, you know, in this day and age. Parts of residential East Orange remain as they have been for decades, but the property tax has become a terrible burden. A $20,000 house would have been taxed at $1,700 last year, and the rate is going up. Even so, blacks own many of the better homes. Even in poor neighborhoods, there's still the pride of ownership. The problem here is overcrowding. Many homeowners take in rent-paying families to help defray taxes and other costs, which is perhaps the fastest road to neighborhood decay. Three-fourths of all dwelling units in East Orange are renter-occupied. An abundance of high-rise apartment buildings makes East Orange the most densely populated city in New Jersey. 75,000 people by a disputed census count in a four square mile area. There's an unusually large number of older people in East Orange. They're predominantly white with deep roots in the city. Some are wealthy and live in luxury apartments. Most are on fixed incomes and it's only the lucky ones who have found public housing like this. 
one of many government services that set East Orange apart from some other communities. I say that a great many of our citizens will tell you that our services are better than some other communities that they have lived in. I would, wouldn't dare to say that we're the best because that would be a fallacy. But we're very far from being a bad service city. Sanitation is a good example of what the mayor is talking about. Recently, East Orange won a Keep America Beautiful Award, one of several citations for cleanliness over the years. Collection service is most frequent where it's most needed, in the overcrowded neighborhoods. And it's reliable. One homeowner said, they missed my garbage one day, so I called the city to complain, and it was picked up in 20 minutes. But the cost for collections has gone up. It nearly doubled last year, despite a concession by residents to carry their garbage cans to curbside for pickup. A concession which kept the rate from going even higher. Quality service is considered a working principle throughout city government, even down to the grinding routine at City Hall. East Orange was one of the first municipalities of its size to install computers to handle the details of government accounting. The city has been innovative, too. In the health department, for example, a family planning center provides information previously available only through private physicians or planned parenthood groups. This means the service is now available to those who need it most, poor people with large families. There's also free dental care for school children. Tooth decay was found so prevalent that the city is moving to fluoridate its water supply. Among the most important health services are those which reach out to the community, including home visits to the elderly by public health nurses, and this neighborhood health center, which offers pediatric care for preschool children of poor parents. Still, the city has its serious problems. Two of these, housing and schools, will be examined in a moment. There are no disaster areas in East Orange, as in Newark and New York City, but housing is in short supply, and much of it is decaying. Some public housing has been built very tastefully for public I, I only, I, I just But the most immediate housing problem is the growing antagonism between tenants and their absentee landlords. East Orange has no rent control or stabilization, and rents have been skyrocketing. While landlords complain of rising costs, Tenants have been organizing into associations, and both sides have been bringing their troubles before the city council, which provides a platform for public complaints at its bi-weekly meetings. Uh, we've had quite a bit of a problem at 262. We've had it for quite a bit of years. I would like to have uh, some uh, form of help at, at 262. We're very concerned. The tenants at 262 have given up. I'm like standing alone because they are afraid uh, to speak out. I have observed on several occasions several buildings which are in the same conditions as that of mine, or the one that I live in, uh, with numerous violations. And I feel that somewhere along the way that somebody is not doing their job. If a landlord puts out garbage pails, and has spaces, are they, there, are they responsible for the garbage that tenants just throw around? I'm not talking about landlords that don't take care of it. Are they responsible also? The landlord is responsible. Um, there seems to me, it seems to me to be a difference between an exorbitant rate of profits and a reasonable rate of profits. And uh, if anyone's dealt with a good number of the landlords in the city, you realize that they're totally concerned with exorbitance and not, and not reasonableness. On behalf of landlords, I think perhaps one of the uh, far-reaching factors between landlord and tenant is the complete lack of understanding. As a tenant, they, they are concerned with how much are they paying. As a landlord, we're concerned as how much are we earning. Of course, the tax rate plays a very important part in the cost of operation of a piece of property. Our water bills, our new insurance rates have gone up, our fuel oil has gone up, our cost of repairs has gone up, and if we can somehow stabilize the operational cost of a piece of real estate, perhaps we could stabilize the rents in the city. Uh, Mr. Greenberg, representing the Landlords Association, I don't know how long you lived in this area. Tenants are not complaining about the increases in rents. 
so much as they are complaining about the lack of services and the deterioration of services. And I think every adult in this room is aware of the fact that when the properties begin to deteriorate and change hands and disadvantaged people are offered these properties, and I don't care whether they're black, blue, white, green, or yellow, the landlords traditionally have taken advantage of these people. In a sense, East Orange is a victim of its own attractiveness as a place to live. Demand for apartments is high, and that gives the upper hand to landlords. One tenant response has been collective bargaining, but landlord recognition has been slow. Recently, this group achieved an important breakthrough. It became the first tenant organization in East Orange to sign an agreement with its landlord. Now, rents in the building have been stabilized, and the landlord has committed himself in writing to high standards of maintenance. Schools in East Orange have all the problems of urban schools generally. Underachievement, drugs, a largely white teaching staff for a largely black student population, and perhaps most fundamentally, overcrowding, especially in the middle and upper grades. East Orange High School has a normal capacity of 1,600, an enrollment of 2,200. It built one addition a few years ago. Now it's converting an old building across the street for educational purposes. A long-range building plan is in the works. The proposed first step is a middle school, grades 5 to 8, which still has not passed its final budget hurdles. A number of designs are being considered, all of which fit a central theme, that the interior should be open, like an artist loft, to allow flexibility in laying out classroom space. It's meant to fit a flexible curriculum of education being tried out now at an experimental school. Noble Young is the school principal. The children have a, a choice of the basic academic subjects, math, science, language, arts, social studies, reading. And in addition to that, we have industrial arts, family living, which formerly was called home economics, fine arts, music, creative drama, physical education. So it's a fairly wide range of activities for the children. They move as individuals. The children must get to the academics, math, science, language, arts, social studies, three hours per week. When they go there and how long they stay when they get there is pretty much left up to them. There is a daily check and a weekly check on where they spent their time during the day or the week. It works very well for about 85 percent of the children. The, the children who are having difficulty here are the same children who had some difficulty in, in a traditional kind of setting. For the majority of the children, they're really involved, they enjoy school. Our attendance rate, for example, runs about 96% a day, which is rather high. It works because I can see children being involved in activities and enjoying what they're doing. And no need for the teacher to be constantly reminding them to get back to work. There's an enthusiasm on the part of the kids that uh, I haven't found in any other school I've worked with. I'm all right. And you look like you need a friend. No, I don't need any friends. I just want to be alone. No, I don't need any money. The open classroom concept, like the one in use at the East Orange Intermediate School, was endorsed recently by New York State Education Commissioner Ewald Nyquist. Experience in England reportedly shows that it works better for middle class children than for poor children. A funny thing happened to the Newark rioters in 1967 on their way to the East Orange Line. They were met there by a delegation of black community leaders of East Orange and persuaded to turn back. The message was clear. Smash Newark if you must. East Orange is our town. And in fact, there is a very substantial, stable black middle class in East Orange. They have a stake in the community. And they are homeowners. They work hard and many go to church. This is one of the Reverend Bailey's involvements, nonprofit rehabilitated housing for the poor, backed financially by the Calvary Church. It's a small effort compared to the need, but the Reverend Bailey says you've got to start somewhere. 
Another of his efforts to do good works turned sour in a way that is revealing of our times. Daycare 100 is a government-funded, parent-controlled day nursery. It's operated by a staff of paid professionals who follow progressive concepts designed to develop children intellectually, aesthetically, and socially. There are other Daycare 100s in New Jersey. This became the first because the Reverend Bailey provided a home, the basement of the Calvary Church. It has not been a happy partnership. Church members complained the nursery took up space needed for church activity. On the other hand, the church was accused of not tidying up after using the nursery for Sunday school. But the argument runs deeper than mere adult squabbling in a child's world to the age-old questions of who controls or how best to shape the minds of children. I think most persons seem to back away from the saying community control. And uh, it's perhaps a fear of what persons could do if they became knowledgeable of what's really out there for them to get if they only knew about it. And it goes as far back as what is OEO all about. And uh, why are we even here? Why were daycare centers formed? And why is the state and the federal government willing to throw money into such programs? And it's just the old line thing of uh, anti-poverty concepts and programs. It also could be a threat to old line institutions and agencies who have been used to being in control. The Bible for instance says, suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Now, it's more than help a mother to get the relief of her child that I was concerned. It's more than to help a mother to go to work, therefore we have a son. This is just part of the answer. The other part of the answer is that I'm concerned that little Janie, little Johnny, little Marie develop into well-rounded, healthy individuals. Whatever the merits, the conflict has been stilled by a parting of the ways. Since this was filmed, the congregation has moved into a new church located even deeper in the city's poorest neighborhood. As for the day nursery, the city is finding it new quarters. Mayor Hart was asked to compare the roles of church and government in the community. Well, the uh, church is the spiritual, and there's still a spiritual part of America, you know, and uh, it's a spiritual part of the community. And uh, I have found that people who go to church are voters. I found this to be a, a very high percentage of our churchgoers in East Orange are the people who also go to the polls. So they are the people who will still dictate a great deal of the policy of the community. And the church plays a very important role in communities such as ours. For all of its fine leadership and civic mindedness, East Orange is not entirely its own master. Interstate 280, for example, is a state and federal project, conceived with the bright promise of contributing to the city's future development. Yet here it lies, unfinished, unsightly, unhealthy, a monument largely to New Jersey's piecemeal style of building highways. This is the next major office site in East Orange, known as the Brick Church Urban Renewal Area. The mayor has given high priority to office development, but considering his budget problems, he has little choice. Office buildings are good revenue producers under the property tax system. So good, they can have the effect of limiting a city's options on long-range planning. For example, when the old suburban hotel was closed, thought was given to turning it over for college use. But councilmen objected that it would mean tax losses. So it's being converted into an office building and to fill the need for off-street parking, an apartment house next door is to be torn down and its residents displaced. So one big question for East Orange is whether its own inner strength can save it from decline. Until the system is improved, it's going to be struggling against great odds. George Page for New Jersey Illustrated.
What makes a city deteriorate? Why do some of the best neighborhoods gradually become run down, semi-commercial areas? What makes stores and offices close their doors and move away from a community? Do once attractive apartment houses turn into tenements? What is it that blights communities, destroys property values, and drives business away? Authorities agree that the wrong type of highway construction through cities is one important cause of urban deterioration. That too often, highway officials base their plans for new roads solely on the cost of construction without regard for the far-reaching impact on the communities that will be affected. Whenever elevated structures have been built through residential neighborhoods and business areas, property values all along the route have been reduced. Tenants refuse to rent dark basement quarters under the shadows of the L. Owners refuse to improve their properties. And lenders refuse to advance money on obviously poor risks. This is the economic price cities pay for the elevated structures through residential and business sections. And the immediate loss in property values is only a fraction of the total price. Elevated structures barricade and divide a city for all time, separate one section from another, and prevent long-range civic planning. And what do the price a city must pay in human values when motorists speed off an elevated highway down to crowded city streets? Think of the opportunities for delinquency and crime under cover of the shadows of elevated structures or in recesses of underpasses. After years of paying the price for elevated structures, some cities have removed them with dramatic results. Once lined with tenements and cheap commercial establishments, Third Avenue, New York, now has a new lease on life. Elevated highways providing safe, speedy transportation at a low cost often are the best solution when they pass over strictly industrial sections or sparsely populated areas. But when they reduce fine residential neighborhoods to slums, when they turn good commercial areas into ghost towns, when they interfere with orderly, long-range city planning, the price is far too high. One progressive city, East Orange, New Jersey, for years has recognized the price that cities must pay for elevated structures through the heart of a community. Conveniently situated only 10 miles from New York and immediately adjoining Newark, East Orange is an ideal residential and shopping area. This prosperous city, with 83,000 people within its four square miles, plans for the future, tackles its civic problems realistically, and acts in the best interest of its future development. Fine homes and modern apartment houses characterize East Orange and attract the kind of people who enjoy and appreciate the many advantages of modern suburban living. More than 27,000 city-owned trees lining mile after mile of lovely streets encourage brisk walks or leisurely strolls. Convenient and well-kept public parks and playgrounds invite apartment dwellers to spend hours of leisure time out of doors in pleasant surroundings. The city's many playgrounds provide fun and helpful recreation for children and their parents as well, while the community's senior citizens spend many pleasant hours bowling on the green. East 
East Orange is justly proud of its scores of houses of worship for people of every religious faith and every denomination. The city's educational facilities are unexcelled. Both public and parochial schools are keeping pace with increasing population. Older buildings are being demolished. To make way for modern new units to meet the community's growing needs. Uppsala College, occupying nearly 40 acres within the city limits, has some 2,000 students. It grants degrees in the arts, sciences, and business administration. An extensive public library system with conveniently located branches circulates more than three quarters of a million books annually to children and adults. The city's master plans for long-range expansion include a systematic program of street improvement and widening to keep traffic moving for an ever-increasing population. For years, East Orange has been a major shopping center for northern New Jersey. Locally owned stores, branches of nationally known retail establishments, and smart specialty stores attract shoppers to downtown East Orange from miles around. Recently, the city has become an important insurance center with more than a score of insurance company home and branch offices. These progressive companies and other similar organizations provide steady employment to thousands of the community's men and women. Ever since East Orange received its city charter, the community has fought to ensure orderly and progressive growth of its residential and business areas. In 1920, the city fought to prevent the erection of the first elevated structure through the center of the city. But the battle was lost. Today, almost 40 years later, the city is still paying the price. This Chinese wall still divides the community. still discourages the improvement of property, still robs the city of enormous amounts of taxes year after year. To help avoid costly mistakes in the city's development, East Orange relies on long-range master plans for its orderly growth and expansion. But the success of the plan depends in large measure on the right alignment and type construction of regional highways through the area. When plans were being made for the construction of the Garden State Parkway, a north-south throughway, the city fought for modification in the construction plans. And this time, it won the fight. This victory not only saved the city millions of dollars, but brought to the community all the other advantages of a well-planned, depressed highway. Today, this beautiful parkway has increased property values throughout the entire city, provides fast, safe transportation, and has preserved the city's plans for future development. Now, East Orange faces still another threat to its economic, social, and civic well-being from another highway. With most of the cost being borne by the federal government, the State Highway Department is preparing to build a long-needed east-west freeway through the city. To protect the community's welfare and help the Highway Department plan the right alignment and type construction of the freeway, the city council appropriated funds to aid the mayor's special committee in studying the problem. In the course of their study, members of the committee and the city engineering department inspected highway construction of all types in many cities. In every case, 
they found depressed highways the best solution for residential and business areas. They asked the advice of outstanding authorities throughout the country. And again, the answer was depress highways through residential and business areas. They engaged nationally recognized independent consulting firms to study the relative impact of different types of highway construction. The results of these studies prove conclusively that the east-west freeway must be depressed. To determine how the city's taxpayers feel about the problem, they conducted personal interviews with East Orange people in every section of the city and from every walk of life. Wherever the interviewers called, no matter whom they asked, the plea was always the same. Depress the freeway through our city. Running through the heart of our city, not only will it affect property owners directly on the right of way, but it is also of vital concern to everyone who lives or pays taxes in the community. It is true that elevating the freeway will result in some immediate saving to the state and federal governments, but that is a relatively small and one-time saving to them. It is only a fraction of what it will cost our city in reduced property values. It will cause neighborhoods to deteriorate and crime and delinquency to increase. Loss of life and property damage will be another tragic result of this elevated man-made monstrosity. Finally, an elevated freeway will disrupt our future planning. A depressed freeway has been a major feature of the original master plan as well as the revised master plan just completed. Evergreen Place, on which more than half a million dollars has already been spent, and other projects may have to be abandoned unless the freeway is depressed.